No, it's Iowa. And why is that your favorite line? It's an answer to a question, are we in heaven? Or is this heaven? That's when uh, Ray Kinsella finally meets his father. Uh, his father is conjured in another form to return to the, uh, the field of dreams and have a game of catch with his son. And uh, somebody says, is this heaven or are we in heaven? And the other person answers, no, this is Iowa. Field of dreams is somewhat mythical. It's become a symbol for, it means a lot of different things to different people. What does the mythical field of dreams mean to you? Well, that uh, I, I don't know quite how to answer your question, um, but the, I have a statement when I encourage Ray to keep the field, and I say, they will come, Ray. Um, and, and, I, and I say they'll come because baseball for this country, for this whole society, is what lets us know is good and what will be good again, you know? Um, the, the simplicity of baseball, the fact that it's a, the team, there's no hero on the team, but they're all heroes. And every hero gets his shot, depending on where the ball lands or where, where the, what part of the bat makes contact with the ball. You know, it, it's, it's, a, it's a very random game, almost like um, the metaphysics of space, the solar system, you know. Um, what do you remember about, this goes back to 1988, do you remember what, when you first heard about this project? I came home one day and my wife said, uh, your agent sent you a script. And she says, first of all, you must do it if they asked you to play a character in it. She says, second of all, the long speech that uh, Terrence Mann says about baseball is too long. It will never end up in the movie because movies don't, don't use uh, extended talking. So she said, that'll end up on the cutting room floor, but you've got to do this movie anyway. And I read it, and I said, you're right. And, and then what happened? It, 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 it didn't end up on the cutting room floor. The curious thing about that speech is it's not, it's not Terrence Mann's speech. The child starts it, and the child shall lead us. <laughs> she, before she gets the hot dog stuck in her throat and almost dies, almost joins the spirit world, she says to her father, no, they, they'll come. If you just set up the lights, and the, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll come, Daddy. They'll, they'll come. And, and my character says, yeah, Ray, they, they will come. And, and I give uh, sort of the, the whole meaning uh, that the society has of, uh, um, about baseball uh, for my reason. What was it like filming? What do you remember about filming in Iowa? It was, I guess, summertime? It was summertime. It was hot. There were flies all over the place, but we didn't notice them. We didn't notice the flies until we went inside. Inside that little white house up there, it was cluster flies. You walk in, and there's no way they could get rid of them. Spraying it every day, but the flies were there because there's manure all over the farm. We spread manure to make the corn grow better. We, the cows plop manure all over the place. Flies are, are a part of farm. Flies and the smell of pig shit, which is a really a sweet, acrid smell. And I, I knew that being raised on a farm, but when I, I got in the VW bus with, with, with Ray Kinsella, I forgot that. I forgot to play the pig smell. And I said, gee, I wish I'd remember that. What was... Um, they, they, they would have cut that. That would have ended up on the cutting room floor. And um, were those working editions hard compared to other movies? Or? It, we didn't notice how... We went fishing a lot. Uh, there were storms that would come up 
and we could see them way off in the distance because, you know, it's, I was the beginning of the Plains States, and uh, uh, we'd rap, and, and the photographers would, would shoot the storm, or shoot the end of the storm with the, with the sunlight coming out again. They, we never wasted any time, but it was interrupted by nature all the time. The, it was so hot, you could really, you couldn't fry an egg on the on the pavement, but you could you could cook it. You put it there long enough, it would cook. Um, corn stalks, when it's that hot, to preserve what moisture they have, they sort of curl up. You know, the corn is sort of flat uh, leaves, but in this case, they would curl up to preserve the moisture, and uh, wasn't growing very fast. So to make the corn look as high as an elephant's thigh, they had to dig trenches between the rows so that when Kevin Costner walked down the row of corn, it was over his head. Uh, the farmers, the local farmers had a lot of fun laughing at us because they, they thought it was ridiculous to tank water in from Lake Michigan to, to make the corn grow. They said, no, corn doesn't grow that way. You might get stalk, but you won't get ears. You get ears when the water comes down from the heavens and brings nitrogen with it, picking up nitrogen from the air. Then you get corn. You get the kernels. You get the good, uh, delicious food from corn. But we, we, we didn't know. We just wanted the stalk to be high, pump water in. I want to ask you about July 4th. 1988, which I'm told was the day the crew shot your famous People Will Come scene. And at least by some accounts, that was done in one take. Do you re what do you remember of that? What I remember about the People Will Come, Ray, as I say, it came from the child first. Um, what I remember was that we had to decide whether to do it simply or whether it should be an oration big. And I said, gee, you know, it's hot. and I'd like to just say it. And so once we decided how it should be delivered, I just got on, up on camera and, and started saying it. And uh, the director had all the team coming in from the field to uh, confirm that this was true. And it became a nice moment, I think. It's also um, told that at the end of that day, when you, you wrapped the shooting, you grabbed the microphone and you told everyone in your best, best Darth Vader voice, may the fourth be with you. I did not. <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> he just asked me, did I grab the mic and say, at the end of the, sh the shot, did I grab the mic and say, may the fourth be with you? I don't remember that. But legends grow, you know. Legends grow out of out of out of cornfields. Were you there when they shot the final scene when like three thousand cars converged on the field at at dusk? We were we were we were all there the night they shot the uh, the cars coming through Iowa. Uh, it was important for us to see that. W one of our one of our producers had a John Deere. Uh, uh, ATV. He was he was driving up and down the road, uh, trying to get the cars lined up, and his ATV tipped over. We thought we'd lost him for a minute, you know. Uh, he was the youngest of the two brother producers. Uh, forgive me, I'm, names escape me, but uh, uh, it, it was impressive to see. Where ordinarily you wouldn't see many cars all day or all night. Uh, that night you saw cars. They will come snicking across Iowa. Did you ever read the novel that the movie is based on, Shoeless Joe? Yeah. And what did, when did you read it and what did you think of it? I read it when I was told that I had a chance to be in the movie. Uh, I had to understand why Ray Kinsella, the writer, uh, chose um, the author of Catcher in the Rye. 
J.D. Salinger. J, J, why he chose J.D. Salinger uh, to kidnap instead of a terrorist man. Terrorist man evolved because J.D. Salinger said, if you use my any image of me or likeness of me or attitude about me, I'll sue you. So they said, well, we can't. <laughs> I thought John Lithgow would have, would have been a great J.D. Salinger, but they couldn't go that way. So the producer said, well, we can't. We can't use a, a, a tall white guy who writes no, novels. Let's use a let's let's have a character, a big black guy who write, who's a journalist. You know, so that that's how Terrence Mann was invented, out of um, uh, duress, really. The scene in the movie where you and Kevin Costner go to Fenway Park, right? Yeah. Did was that shot at Fenway Park? You're, yes, it can was. You, can you? What do you remember of that? Scene. What a beautiful park it is. And, and it was so beautiful that the grass is important. And the uh, horticulturalists that make that grass so beautiful were hired to come out to Iowa with their seed and their know-how and try to replicate that same kind of grass in Iowa. I don't know if they succeeded or not. It depends on what the camera picked up. But uh, sitting in Fenway Park, it was... Uh, it's a, it's a magical place, yeah. <laughs> As a kid, were you a baseball fan, and are you now a baseball fan? No, as as a kid, all I remember about baseball in my little community, we had a, a one-town store. We had a, a one-store town, and across from the store, there was a field that we used to use as a baseball field. I remember uh, visiting teams. We'd gather out there, and we'd try to get... Uh, our little town, Dublin, Michigan, would try to get enough people to play baseball against them. And the House of David was one of those touring companies, uh, guys with beards like that. And some of them had real beards, some of them had fake beards, but they were the House of David, and we were playing baseball against them. Dizzy Dean used to do that. Uh, he'd play off with uh, black teams during the off season. They'd have they'd have tournaments. <laughs> and, uh, uh, he would bring guys from his team out on the on the road, and he they'd do pickup games. You know, whoever wanted to play. Are you a baseball fan now? No, no. Um, you see, when I was raised, uh, there was no TV, and baseball on radio was very boring, frankly until they started adding sound effects to, to radio, baseball radio. Uh, you know, it, it, but that, I say boring, it, it's, it's, it's pleasant because I remember I took my son to his first baseball game in Anaheim out in California. And what I noticed about him was he could watch the birds, the seabirds flying over uh, without losing the game. Most games, you got to watch that puck or watch that basketball or, or you can't keep up. But baseball, you sit back and relax. And the moments of drama happen only sporadically. And, and you don't know who's going to get the drama. Who, who does the ball go to? Who hits the ball? Who catches the ball? Everybody is a potential hero. And that's why baseball is so hard to um, do movie dramas about, I think, because it's, it's hard to single out who's the hero. The whole team is the hero. The whole game is the hero. Where would you, if you rate your roles in film or on stage, where does Field of Dreams fit in? It fits in with, uh, I'm mainly a stage actor. Uh, it fits in with one of the very few movies I've done that I really cherish. Uh, others, like John Sayles' uh, Mate One, about coal miners. Movies that have very simple themes, simple stories to tell, but very powerful, compact, and in the simplicity is the secret, I think, to why they're important to me. I won't say why they're successful. I don't know if they're successful. But why they're important to me is because the, the simpl in that simplicity, magic can happen if, it, if you just let it happen, you know. And don't force it. And I think that that was uh, Philip Robinson's choice with Field of Dreams. It, uh, 
even with things like the cornfield was the edge of uh, li- uh, you know, eternity, and you, you to exit this world, you just walk into the cornfield, and suddenly you disappear. Nothing to it. You could stick your hand in, and your hand would disappear, and they wanted me to giggle and carry on with it, and I thought this is ridiculous, but I did it. But it was that simple, and no, no attempt to uh, to explain it in sort of uh, intellectual words, you know. One of the themes of, the, of both the novel and the movie is the relationship between the father and son uh-huh. and their estrangement. In any way, did that relate to your own real life experiences with your father? With my father? Yes. Uh, what's interesting about fathers and sons in America is that, it's a long answer, is that mom is the important uh, per- parent, the important entity, because she carries the, the milk, you know, and every child. That's your primary companion. There's dad over there. Okay, uh, I'll see you later, dad, you know. And later it happens when a, a father says to his boy, let's go out in the backyard and play catch. That's the American first bond between fathers and sons. Uh, game of catch. I think it's universal. I mean, in this country. Um, and that, that, that's, that's how simple the movie stayed, I think. Because at the end, <laughs> the father returns. A spirit force is conjured and he appears. No explanation, just he's there. And the question is, are we in heaven? No, it's Iowa. Did you have catches with your own father? I, 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 I really uh, um, dance around that question. No, I wasn't, I wasn't raised with my father. Uh, but but what, what I learned from Field of Dreams was that every son has a need to recollect, reconnect, or resolve something, whether the, the relationship was good or bad. It doesn't matter. The father has to be accounted for. You know, uh, in my case, I followed my father's footsteps and became an actor as he would, but was an actor. I like to say he is an actor. He still is. <laughs> uh, but that, that was my connection. It was no, no, let's go out in the backyard and play catch, but, but let, let's, let's uh, go on the stage together and play, act, and play characters. We can go back to Iowa. Have you been back? Since the shooting to Iowa at all? No, no. I, 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 I know that world so well from being a farm kid myself that, uh, you know, pig shit is pig shit and flies are flies and it's a wonderful life. Apparently in Iowa there's, there's been some debate about what to do with the field, how much to develop it. Have you followed any of that or do you have any opinions on what should be done with the the field of dreams? I've read some things about it, yeah. Um, and uh, whatever, they, whatever they want to do in Dyersville, I think it's their, it, it's their field. There are fields all over the country. But that particular one was where the movie was made, and I think it has a special magic to it. And if they want to preserve it and uh, uh, make something of it, th- that's good. Dyersville has, they make these little toy uh, Farm machinery. I collected a few myself. There's a, uh, I forget the name of them. Dyersville, is it? Uh, Miniature farm toys. That's the only industry I know know of there. But it's good to have Field of Dreams field. It's good. Have you, and apparently there are some. Uh, baseball players or reenactors and the ghost players. Have you seen them at all? No, no. I just saw them in the movie and saw them on the field when we were shooting. Right. It's, it's, it's impressive. You know, they have these white suits on. They come out of the cornfield. See, I, I, I think the movie, if you don't mind my diverting for a minute, is about confluence of spirit forces. Uh, the last one happens when the father comes out of nowhere and says, let's have a game of catch. Father's dead. But there's a need in Ray 
that he's somehow conjured to return. And if you build it, he will come. Simple as that. And he built it. Uh, the first uh, confluence of, of spirit energy happens when we're, uh, we're in this town at night and Ray says, come, go, go with me to, uh, up to uh, the town in Minnesota. Find Doc Graham. And I said, no, I, 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 you, you go ahead. I'll, I'll see you. And I, I do this. And I say goodbye. The bus turns around, and who's standing in the headlights? This guy, Terrence Mann. Something's happened to him. He said, I'm not going. Suddenly, he's there. Let's go. Um, and they, they go, I think, to, uh, Everett, to uh, the field in, in Boston, and they go to the town. I, another little confluence of uh, spirit force I, I, I can share with you. When Kevin and I went to, it, it was a mock-up of the town in, um, what was it, Minnesota Iowa, uh, or, or, or uh, Wisconsin? It, it was Minnesota, I guess, where Doc Graham was from. Uh, uh, we went to the newspaper office. The lady they cast in the movie to play the, the editor of the newspaper, her name was Anne Revere. I worked with Anne Revere the first time I was ever on Broadway. She played the mother of Franklin Delano Roosevelt in a play called Sunrise at Campobello. I played the house servant. And Anne suddenly appears in my life again in this movie. She passes away two weeks after she did that scene. I'm not saying, I'm not talking about ghosts. I'm just talking about a confluence of Spiritual energies. It was very. It was very nice to have that moment. That moment with Anne. For you know, it, that doesn't happen often in, in movie making. But we all ships that pass in the night, and sometimes we have a connection. You know. Talking about the, the field and building it, um, I was asked to ask you whether you've ever been asked to purchase the site or invest in whatever they want to do. There. Oh no, I'm, I'm not an investor. I like to work, but I'm not an investor. In terms of sports movies or baseball movies, where does Field of Dreams stack up? I tell you, I've seen a couple of good sports movies. One about football, a couple about football. I say it's hard to make a good drama about baseball because who's the hero? Uh, at what moment is he a hero? Uh, so Field of Dreams, I think, qualifies. If you don't lean too heavily on the fact that it's about baseball, but it's also about father-son and other spirit confluences, I think it, it, it's, it's an important film, but not, not because of the sport, because of the American society. Philip Alden Robinson. i work worked with him since, by the way. <coughs> he manages to keep all of his stories very simple. Did you ever meet the author of the novel, W.P. Kinsella? No. No. Uh, um, I marvel that he established in his novel the poetry of baseball that all those speeches come out of um, that resonate with Bart Giamatti when Bart was, was uh, uh, president of the, uh, Yale University. I, I got to know him a little bit because we, we did work with the drama department. But he wrote poetry very similar to what Kinsella wrote about baseball. And he's not the only one. Um, but it, it, sort of, it, it, it touched, it touched uh, not a nerve, but it, it touched an insight in other writers to write very sweeping poetry about baseball. Maybe it's the only sport that you can do that with because it is simple. <laughs>